Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome any visitors. We are grateful for anyone who comes and worships with us and joins, so we're glad to have you a part of our family this morning. I want to give a special thank you to everyone who served in the Christmas concert. There were just so many behind the scenes and many, many hours were sacrificed, and it was just such a, a blessing. And I don't think there's anything sweeter than being weary from laboring for the name of Jesus Christ. It's a blessed weariness. So thank you all uh, for, for just what you did. I, I heard so many beautiful things from visitors, the church. It was just God was moving. What, one uh, kind lady said her only complaint uh, was her, she came last, time, last Sunday for the first time and then came Friday night, and she said that you didn't have enough Kleenexes uh, around. And so just God was moving and touching hearts in a beautiful way. Um, thank you to the Abel family. That was beautiful of Emmanuel. Um, just, I pray that um, this would be a time to continue to, to set our hearts on the beauties of the gospel in Christ entering this world to save it. So it can be an amazingly edifying time or it can bring spiritual declension if we lose Christ in, in the busyness. So we're continuing to try to keep your focus on that, which will bless you. Next Sunday will probably be a sermon on the Incarnation. Uh, the 24th, that Sunday morning, Pastor Rutland will be bringing us a message on uh, the Incarnation. And then that night, I'll be preaching on John 6 for our Christmas Eve service. And so I pray that um, this would be a sweet time together. This morning, what I would like to do, if you would uh, just turn to John 15, I'd like to finish up our study. We've been looking at the beauties of abiding in Jesus Christ, God's been really doing some, some wonderful things in, in my own heart and in your hearts, and he's just, the lampstand is present, and he's moving in each one, and I thank him for that. Uh, but my goal, though, is that you, not just for you to understand this portion of Scripture, uh, I, I want you to, this Greek word epinosis is this full knowledge where you, you get it in your heart. And so I'm praying that that John 15 isn't something academic. It is, it is getting into your heart and you are getting what Christ is proclaiming in that upper room. This morning is my attempt now to try to tie up some loose strings from that section. I think I could spend a long time in this tying up loose strings, but I'm gonna try to just grab the main string that I think will help us in our journey to, to, uh, to hear Christ's invitation and command, come abide in me. So let me read John 15 one more time, John 15, 1. Just one more time in this series. I'm going to read it the rest of my life. <clears throat> I am the true vine. There's so many false vines out there, and I love that ego in me. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it might bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Praise be to God. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just, just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, why? So that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be made full. Let's pray. Father, I pray that every soul in here that knows you, that their joy would be made full every soul that has walked in here that does not know you, that they would have joy for the first time, true 
joy of having a right relationship with the living God, to stand in grace. Oh, what could be sweeter than to stand in the favor of God? I pray, Lord, that you would move in each and every heart then this morning. I pray that as we finish this up, that you would meet us here this morning in a really powerful way. Lord, let this, if there's some that this point we look at this morning is tripping them up, keeping them from fullness of joy, I ask this morning that by your word, through your spirit, that you would clarify um, cloudy thinking. God, clarify our understanding of this truth. Lord, help us to, to see it exactly the way you have said it and mean it. God, let us behold the beauty and the truth of what is in this word and that you would do the specific work in every mind and heart here this morning. Let everyone prepare him room. Jesus, come do more than we could hope or think, I pray. Amen. Again, what Christ is after in this passage is fruit. He wants fruit that gives glory to the Father, fruit that's real, lasting, and that the world will look at and know it had to come from God and he would get the glory as in Matthew 5, 16. The way that will ever happen, the way we will ever get fruit that glorifies God is by abiding in Jesus Christ. And this is the one then who has been joined to Jesus by faith in this free gospel that we just heard about this morning. That when you come to Christ and believe, your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west, they're washed. God himself says, I'll remember your sins no more. They're gone. And so this gospel can wash away your sins and bring you into a one flesh relationship with Jesus Christ, like a vine and a branch, like a husband and a wife. What an offer. I love that what, what was mentioned this morning, that he came near. Like, how do you bring someone any nearer than a vine and a branch or a husband and a wife? So all these things that we have on this earth was so that God would let us be able to understand the nearness and the oneness that Jesus wants to enjoy with us in this gospel. This is overwhelming. His life then becomes yours. And so the life that he lived is as if you lived it and the death that he died for your sins is as if you hung on that cross and you died. But he gives you even more. <laughs> Not just his record, but he gives you himself. You get to abide in him now as a child of God. You get to live out of his fullness and his power and his joy. He holds nothing back. He's given you everything for life and godliness. He, he doesn't keep anything back from you at all. He's given you everything himself. I'm so glad that God doesn't just say, here's your rule book. Here, go get after it. So many of you still think that's the Christian life. Instead, he, he joins you to a person in marriage and he says, in him now, you have everything that you need to go bear fruit. Abide in me, stay, remain, believe, trust, surrender, and you will bear much fruit. And we've been seeking as a church to learn what does that mean? That means much to me. It is to live by faith then, and what this word reveals of Jesus Christ. I'm believing what God says is true and has been re revelation to us of Jesus. And what I want to do then is stay in communion and relationship with him. Enjoy it. The relationship is the foundation of all holiness and all transformation. The vine is where all the sufficiency will flow through our branches and we will bear much fruit. And the only way to overcome sin, sin comes and says, here's, here's what's going to make you happy. This is going to satisfy you. This will give you real security, real, real meaning, real contentment. So every sin is playing on your desire for happiness and wanting to please yourself. And the only way we will ever overcome sin is we've got to get a greater pleasure. There's got to be something that takes us up more than what's being offered. And that is what comes from abiding. I love the hymn, temptation loses its power when thou art near. When, when, when you're near and I'm abiding and believing and staying and remaining, temptation, it just loses its power. I want you to get that. 
Is that true of your life? So what we must battle is not to try and make abiding a work. As I've been journeying these weeks with some of you, um, I've done the same thing a hundred times. All of a sudden, abiding is my new Ten Commandments. And I got to go work harder at abiding. And you're like, I'm just not doing very good at it. I'm trying harder and I'm not abiding. That's to miss the whole thing. It's not a work. It's a faith. It's a, a rest. I love that hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. I'm resting in Christ and all that he is and all that this word has revealed. But as we've said before, we must fight the fight of faith. There is a diligence, there's a resistance, there's a fight in this Christian life. Let his word abide in you. Get in it, see Jesus in it, which that shouldn't be hard. Since Jesus said, I'm the fulfillment of the whole thing. It says to you, everything in the law and the prophets pointed to me. So if you're having a hard time seeing Jesus in the Bible, you're missing the whole Bible. And so he's saying, get in the word and see me and and see my beauty and the plan and the glory. John Piper said, this weapon is available to any Christian who reads the Bible merely as a book of motivation and inspiration, but rather as a manifestation of Jesus Christ and his glory. So it's not just my book of motivation and inspiration. It's the revelation of Jesus and all of his glory. And when I get in the word and start seeing that, what bubbles up is an affection, a greater desire for him than all these promising pleasures that are lesser that the world is throwing at me. So faith can realize the presence of an unseen Savior. Peter says, though you do not see him now, you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible. And so I can actually commune with an unseen Savior because of this gospel and the Holy Spirit uniting us as one. So the Christian has to daily reorient his life to Christ. That is the life of faith. And to find our all in all in Christ, to keep coming back and seeing all that he is and all that he's promised to us. And so the Christian must daily reorient this then. Um, John Newton, I keep coming back to him and and you're going to get a little more Newton this morning and then I'll stop. But listen to this. Look unto him, Jesus. Again, as he now reigns in glory, see him in glory. Possessed of all power in heaven and in earth with thousands of thousands of saints and angels worshiping before him. Just picture it. And 10,000 times 10,000 ministering unto him. And then compare your sins with his royal divine blood. Compare your wants with all of his fullness. Your unbelief with all of his faithfulness. Your weakness with all of his strength. Your inconstancy with his everlasting love. If the Lord opens the eyes of your understanding, you would be astonished at the comparison, says Newton. Look at him. Look your eyes out at Christ. So abide in me. Um, And the Father is the vine dresser and he will prune. I don't want to keep wearing you out on this, but let my words abide in you have been our commands. Um, Abide in prayer. And then last week we looked at abide in my love, the way the Father loves us just as he loves the Son. I'll meditate on that the rest of my days. And that is the soil in life that abundant fruit will grow up. And so how's it going? How are you doing in this? Well, yeah, I'm going to try to bless you this morning. John Newton goes on. If I may speak of my, of my own experience... I find that to keep my eyes simply upon Christ as my peace in my life is by far the hardest part of my calling. Does that help just a little bit to have the great godly man John Newton say, this has been the hardest thing I've ever done, is to just keep abiding, fighting to keep my eyes on Christ. Everything in this world is set against that. Everything from the demonic world in my own flesh is set against this. So I just want you to know this won't be just the, 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 uh, not attacked, not difficult. It's beautiful. But I want you to realize that it's going to be a fight of faith to rest in Christ 
alone and to abide and stay in this sweet place. So Newton says, welcome to the lifelong battle for a more simple dependence upon Jesus as my all in all and to the lifelong struggle to account everything as loss and dross that dares to stand in competition with him. Welcome to the lifelong battle and the lifelong ambition (coughs) to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that your ambition? So welcome to it. And to be more humble in our own eyes, more weaned from self, more fixed upon him as our all and all, till at last we shall meet him before his throne. So he's saying to abide in him. Keeping the eyes of our mind focused on the glory of Christ is the sweet battle of the believer and the hardest part of the Christian life. So I, I, I hope that helps to realize that as you see this and understand it, all hell is set against it. And so it will be attacked and it will be difficult. And what I'm going after this morning is, as one of your pastors, is I want to help you. Um, how, how do I abide in Christ as a sinner? Am I speaking to anyone in this room? Uh, If you're not a sinner, um, you're dead, and you're already in glory. So hallelujah, congratulations. (laughs) What's it like? So what I want to address this morning is that which hinders our abiding. So we've just been looking at the beauty of it, and now I want to shepherd you in the areas that I've, in my own journey, every day that I fight, it's called sin, and sin affects abiding. If we could maintain our communion with Christ, the lures of temptation and of the flesh in the world would be absolutely ineffective. And so what what I call that perpetually is heaven. And I want heaven on earth. I want to be as holy as a man can be this side of glory to dwell there, to stay there, to fight this fight of faith. So remaining sin makes these petty and futile joys lure us. They attract us. They draw us. And if I could just abide in Christ, what an evil sin would appear. When I am there, just sin loses its luster. It's evil. It it put my my one I'm abiding in on a cross, groaning. It just, sin just, just doesn't trick me when I'm abiding in Jesus Christ. Personal sin comes and it breaks this communion that we have with Christ. I, had so, I just want you to get this. God hates sin. Do you think now as a believer, he hates it less? God hates sin because it's a revulsion to his holy character. And so I want you to get that we hate sin. And if we abide in him, we hate sin. But this sin breaks our fellowship. And that's what's given me a holy hatred for sin this morning. Because you can't live in known sin and the joy of the Lord. God designed it that way. Indwelling sin is real. Everyone has it that's a believer. And it will be taken away in glory. But it can cloud our joy in Christ. It can make the Bible seem flat and dull. It can make this Worship service, um, your best nap you get of the week. I'm on to you. (laughs) Just affects us. It does. And this is where the fight of faith to cling to Jesus comes in. And Newton said, I approach the throne of grace encumbered with a thousand distractions of thought, and each of which seems to engage more of my attention than the business I have at hand to come meet with God and pray and commune with him. And so all these thoughts he's saying can, can take the precedence over why I even came to the throne. And so what I want to do this morning is, is love you and give you the best answer that God has given me for this battle. So we're leaving John behind, but not John. We're going to move to 1 John. And so if you will flip forward to 1 John chapter 1, almost to the end of your Bibles. If you're with us this morning and you don't know where 1 John is, don't feel bad because my first Bible study when I got saved, they asked me to read a passage and as I turned red for 15 minutes and couldn't find it, it was was rough. So (laughs) 
don't feel bad, man. We're learning this word together, and you're going to just keep learning more and more where everything is in your Bible. So welcome to all of us as sinners trying to journey to glory together. So before we begin, I got a lot of time. <laughs> this feels good. Thomas, you did a good job. You got done early, I think. You get Star Student Award. I just want you, before I start, even looking at the passage we're going to look at, I just want you to see how consistent John is. So if you'll just look at 1 John 2.24 with me. John says, as for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning, this glorious message, gospel. If what you heard from the beginning then abides in you, You also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This this gospel gets in, and what it's going to do is it's going to bring you into fellowship with the Father and the Son. And so here's this beautiful abiding. Go to 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. And you have no need then for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him, Jesus. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming because I've been abiding and bearing fruit and I know him. And when he comes, I'm running to him. I'm not going to do this. Because the gospel has cleansed me and set me free and I'm living in it. I'm running to Jesus when he comes, not hiding in shame because I've been, my sin's been dealt with. Abide. Look at John 3, 1 John 3, 6. No one who abides in him can be sinning, present tense. So this is so big, you, you can't be abiding in Jesus and just continuing in sin. These two are, are diametrically opposed. And sometimes you read 1 John, and I think it flips people. Well, I got sin. I can't be a believer. And these present tenses are big. Sinning. Just staying in it. Choosing it. You can't stay there and stay in the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ and what we've been seeing and abiding. Those two, you can't bring them together. I love that. That God won't let those two come together. So somehow we got to fix this. If we're going to have this. And so praise God that you can't abide in Jesus and be abiding in continuing sin. It's why you're sick and frustrated this morning if you're living in that. And you won't turn and you won't stop. And you're drinking it up like water. You're miserable. And God's saying, you, 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 you can't have that in this. It's beautiful. Look with me at 1 John 3.17. <clears throat> Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Abide in my love. And when you do, and you see someone in need, what's going to happen? I'm going to meet it. I'm going to care. And so he's saying, if it abides in you, you will not close your heart and not care about people. So if you are the, what is, what is the, uh, Laura, what's the, the play with the guy? Scrooge. So if you're a spiritual Scrooge uh, this morning, he's saying the love of God's not abiding in you. When it does, it, it opens your heart up by his love. 1 John 3, 23. <clears throat> this is his commandment. What's your commandment? That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. We believe this gospel. That's the command that God's giving to you this morning. And that we love one another just as he has commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him. And he in him. Starting to sound like anything you've ever heard before. John 15 last week, that's almost to a T. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Wow. Uh, 412. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us 
and his love is perfected in us. Let's go to verses 15 through 16 of chapter 4. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that's faith, the gospel, God abides in him. And he in God. There it is again. You're in him. He's in you by his spirit. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Abide in my love. We've come to know it and believe it. That's what believers are this morning. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. He's just kind of bringing it all together to this climactic statement now of what we've been learning. And so this reality has taken John up, and it should. And so what I want to focus on this morning is go back to chapter 1 then. Isn't that beautiful? I preached this for Christmas a few years back, and I'm just going to read it real quick. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. These could be some of my favorite verses in the Bible. John says, what was from the beginning, which... John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, the Word was God and the Word was with God. So what was from the beginning was Jesus, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes. We've seen him, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the Word. The Word became flesh, the Word of life and dwelt among us. We beheld him with our eyes and we touched him. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and we testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, the, the one who gives eternal life. I'm the resurrection of life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. We proclaim to you the one who gives eternal life, who which was with the Father, eternity past, and was manifested to us, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. And what we have seen and what we have heard from Jesus, we proclaim to you also so that you too might have fellowship with us, that this gospel would be believed and received and you would enter into a fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with the Godhead. And we're preaching this gospel and telling you so we can all come together and have fellowship around our oneness and fellowship with the Godhead. These things we write so that our joy might be made full. Again, sounds familiar from last week. And so that is his introduction. <laughs> and now this morning, actually what I want to focus on is, is not that. I want to focus on verses 5 through 10 with our remaining time. And the outline we're going to look at is in verse 5 now. We're going to, we're going to look at this truth. It's a, it's a theological foundation to the whole letter. <clears throat> and then in verses 6 through 7, John's going to apply this truth. And then in verses 8 through 10, he's going to give some clarification. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. So if you'll look with me, the truth in verse 5. This is the message that we have heard. Here's the gospel from him, and we announce it to you. God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. This is the foundation that the whole letter is built on. God is light. I think of Isaiah when he said the world was sitting in darkness and the light is going to come and shine. The light is the manifestation of God. It's the Shekinah glory that led Israel in the wilderness, a cloud of pillar, uh, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day. It's God's blazing glory. It's his perfections shining. In verse 6, it's his truth. It's that he's perfectly true. There's no lies or deceit in him. He's, he's all light. He's glorious within and without. Um, nothing but light in our God, a holiness that no one can fathom. There's no darkness in him. So John's saying there's no sin. There's no defect. There's no confusion. There's no deceit. And I think of this fallen world and it's all darkness. Everything is a lie, deceit, fallen, sinful. It's just the two are just completely juxtaposed. There is no spot or darkness in God, just blazing pure light, holiness that, that's majestic and brilliant. Who's, who's a God like ours? 
That's what we abide in. Just take that this morning. That is the one that we abide in. And the application is if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. (laughs) So if we say we have fellowship with him, what's that? Well, that's abiding. If we say we abide in this deep relationship and communion and walk with God, which is what every Christian should testify to, that I've been saved and I've been brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we say that and we walk in the darkness and the walk is a, it's your pattern of life because every one of us have had been in the darkness this week. And so this is just someone who walks in the darkness. This is what you are characterized by. If you, I have fellowship with Jesus, which is, I think, 62% of Americans claim, and walk in darkness. He says it's a lie. The, you walk in this world that has no light. And you act like it, you think like it, you love what it loves. You are according to darkness. To live your life as if there is no God whose light is the one he's talking about. I think that's what he's getting at maybe in 2.15 where he says, do not agape the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, all this darkness is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world's passing away and it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so I, I just have always looked at this world is the black velvet when you go look at a diamond to, to make it more illustrious when he puts a diamond on the prong. And this whole dark world is so that the believer will shine more brightly when he is saved and set apart. So he's saying, how do you love the black velvet? Why, why do you sacrificially love what I've designed to show you everything that I'm not so that you'll radiate and shine in this world? Do you see how counterintuitive that is? Uh, look at John, uh, 1 John 2. Let's go to verse 8. On the other hand, John says, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he's in the light, and now he's going to say the darkness here is he hates his brother, he's still in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so it's real clear that if we say we have fellowship with God and our way of life, our pattern is just in the darkness. We live as if there is no God. But uh, John just says very clearly, you lie and you don't practice the truth. You can say till the cows come home, I know him, I know him. And he's saying, you walk in this darkness and that's your life, that's what you're about. And you say you have fellowship with God, you're a liar. You're lying. Verse seven says, but, I want to look at the positive If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, and we see the one who said, I'm the truth, and we see the reality of God now, the the truth that Christ has revealed, and what we've seen in these scriptures, we see Jesus. And he's the light. He's our North Star now. He is what drives and guides who I am, what I love, what I seek. And John says there are two things in if you walk in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And I just want you to don't miss this. What joins us together, I, I know a lot of places where you just fellowship is everything. And we, all that means is we grab hamburgers and watch Broncos. And I'm not against that. But what he's talking about here is bigger. We'll have koinonia with one another because we walk in the light and we know Jesus and we love him and we're seeking to abide in him and be pleasing to him. So we, 
We come on a Sunday after being beat up all week in the darkness that hates him and hates what we love and it's all flipped and you come in here and you get koinia with someone who loves Christ, who sees him as everything, who worships him, who hears his word and says, I want to be a doer of this word this morning. Do you, do you see the beauty? As we walk in the light, we'll have koinia with one another. And then the, the gem of it all, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from, and I want, you can even yell it out if you want, all sin. And I've just been praying because I think some of you need to hear that in your heart this morning. It cleanses you from all. You know what the word all means? All. All sin. All sin. And so have you ever come to that place when the Spirit's revealing to you the depth of your sin? That you're not a sinner because you sin, but because you're a sinner, you sin. And he's just kind of showing you the blackness of your heart and the remaining sin. God will do this in your life. And this is so big. Abide when sin seems so big and our failures seem so long and it seems so deep in our heart and it seems so repeated and it seems so abundant. Abide in the gospel. Stay in it. Newton, we, we sing this song and we stole it from him. And he said, my sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And so abiding as my sins are many, his mercy is more. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two things Newton said on his deathbed. I can only remember that I'm a great sinner and he's a great savior. That's abiding in Christ to his last breath. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Praise be to God. Maybe you needed to hear that this morning. And now why I wanted to preach this is my third point. Uh, this is his clarification in verses 8 through 10. And this just broke out on me this week in a beautiful way. There are two errors that he's dealing with. One is that your conduct after salvation doesn't matter. And verses 6 through 7 say it does. And you can't keep walking in darkness and say that you abide in him. And so it matters. And then on the other side is that your conduct after salvation has to be perfect. And he's going to address that. He says, if you, if you say you don't have sin, you're a liar. And so he's going to deal with two things here this morning, and then we'll look at why I picked this passage. <laughs> this is good. God is light, and in him there's no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie. And so this is really important because nothing affects my abiding more than sin. Nothing affects my abiding more than sin and thinking wrongly about sin. God hates sin. He always will. John is telling us <coughs> that there is a way then, I want you to hear this, to stay in fellowship with God as a sinner, man, it's warm. Is it just me? There is a way to enjoy him in sweet relationship. He's, he's calling you to it before you are made perfect in glory. So the only time you'll ever be perfect is when you get to glory. And so this is a call to enjoy him this morning as a redeemed sinner who still has remaining sin. And so verse 8, let me read it. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I've had people look me in the face and say, I don't sin. And I always want to step back because the lightning's coming. <laughs> and then verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, this is powerful, we make him a liar. I wish we could talk that way more often today. We make him a liar. And his word is not in us. That's not very acceptable in our culture, is it? We make him a liar. 
So I want you to hear this. Denying our sin is walking in darkness. It's walking in darkness. He says denying our sin cuts off fellowship from God. So there has to be a way to have fellowship with God if we're going to abide in the true vine as a sinner. If not, I'm sunk. I have no hope. And so the, the lie of verse 6, if you say you have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, that's to live into sin and stay in it and to think the same thoughts about the world and desires and what you want from this life. It's just a lie. So you're in darkness, but now as believers, there's a way to be a sinner and have fellowship with this God who is light and holy and majestic. This could be the best news in the world. My abiding is ruined by sin. It breaks it. It wounds it. It grieves it. It hurts it. And then I don't find any joy and delight in the truth of Christ. I've been listening to you for a month, Pastor, and I, I find no joy. And if that's the case, it's, I know I'm a problem, but it's sin. It's sin. I'm certain I'm a branch that's been cut off. It's a miserable place to live. And so I've got the best news for you this morning. Confessing our sin is what it means to walk in the light. Denying our sinfulness cuts us off from fellowship with God. But confessing it restores it. So get this, sin is a great horror. And it breaks my fellowship with Christ. It hurts my relationship to the one that I love so dearly. I'm abiding in his love. And it affects the communion that I enjoy with him. So when the gospel breaks in and you're joined to Christ, to hurt that relationship with that one is a deep, deep grief. And as I stay there and abide and remain, it grows. Like it, it is a bigger grief today than when I was first saved. True abiding will make sin a huge burden and grief. So pastor, what do I do with my sin? That is, seems to be in plenty some days. Well, let's start with what I don't do. You ready? Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't try to to make up for it with God. I'm going to read my Bible every day this week. I'm going to do the Advent devotions. And God's going to kind of be happy with me again. I'll make it up. I'll make it up to him. I'm going to work harder to show him that I really love him. I'm an avoider. And I don't like conflict. I'm going to avoid God. I'm just going to get busy. I'm going to go on with my life. I just, I'm not going to look this in the face and deal with it. I'm going to try to act like everything's good between us. Sweep it under the rug. We're good, aren't we, God? You gave me Jesus. And I want to explain why it wasn't really my fault. It's the woman you gave me. To deal with it on a rainy day. I'll just, I'll just wait. I'll deal with it when I feel like it. And sometimes you are so ashamed of your sin that it's hard to face God and be vulnerable. What did David do? I want you to listen to Psalm 32. And he had some things that were, were deep. Rape and murder. And he said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of the summer. Selah, take it in. I acknowledged my sin to thee. I confessed my sin to thee. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. You can't abide in Christ and abide in your sin. Just you can't. 
walking in the light, it shines. And it reveals you can't continue in it. It just comes. We now have sin consciousness as believers. That's what the light does to us. And so David tried to hide it, and it almost killed him. And so this is so big, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. What do we do with our sin then? And in the middle of verse 8 and 10 is just pure gold. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a way to stay in fellowship with God, who's light. We confess it. Homo legeo is the Greek word. Homo means the same, and legeo means logic. Come before God, and I'm in agreement with you, God. This is sin. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to come naked before you and say this is sin. When pastor said the light shines and it shows the dreadfulness of our remaining sin and the abundance of God's grace. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So the light shows us our dreadful sin, but it also shows us the abundant mercy that we have in Jesus Christ to be cleansed from what you're looking at and seeing. And so I don't hide it. I don't put it under the rug. I stare it in the face with God, confess it, and I see it for what it is, and I see Christ for what he is. He cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus, again, cleanses us from all sin. If you're sitting here ranking them and saying, I got a 10, that one can't be forgiven, I want you to see it's all sin can be forgiven. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. This is abiding in Christ. When I sin, I have a way to restore my relationship with him. The best news you've ever heard, I can stay in relationship with him. If I say I don't have sin, I'm a liar. If I confess it, it's faithful and just to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness and restore my fellowship so I can keep remaining and abiding in Christ. The light. The light is our joy that our sin is forgiven. And grief is that so much still remains. And so don't miss this. Last week, his love abides on me. And this is a hard truth. Even when I sin and break fellowship, his love is still on me. I I can't quench it. And that makes me all the more want to confess it and be restored to Christ. Amazing love, how can it be? Isn't that awesome? I can have fellowship with Christ as a sinner. But to walk in the light is to not deny our sin, but to confess it. And he'll cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. I'm running out of time. So if you had put in your notes, if you're taking notes, go read Psalm 51. Just let it overtake your heart this afternoon. And I'm going to give you a conclusion from that Newton book by the author, the author, Tony Reinke. He said, Newton was no stoic. He said, Jesus endured the cross to win joy to share with us. The Christian life is driven by the anticipation of experiencing full joy with Jesus face to face. That's our finish line. But for now, rejoicing in Christ is our daily pursuit. We aim to rejoice always on the mountaintop and in the valley as we conquer and while we fight the fight of faith. When the Lord is shining on us and when he seems to be hiding from us, 
Therefore, nothing undercuts the Christian life like Christian, uh, a Christ amnesia, thinking that we can live safely for a moment without Christ, without his atoning blood, without renewed communion with him. That's the most dangerous thing that can happen is to forget Christ. So keeping Christ in view at all times is by far the hardest and the most essential part of our calling as Christians. And I was going to go over John 13, where Peter was uh, wanting him to wash his feet, but I, I don't have enough time. It's just sweet. You know, he's, he's washing feet, and Peter says, not mine. He goes, then you have no place with me. And he says, okay, then wash my whole body. He says, you don't need your whole body washed. It's already been cleansed. And this is this whole picture of you are already perfectly forgiven, washed from all your sins right now. And as you walk in this world, your feet will get dirty. And when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. So that's John 13. <laughs> Application. Some material that I've been going through on my own and with some others. In it, he says, if, if you're battling with doubts, thinking that God then won't forgive your sin, uh, or you can't forgive yourself, as you sit here and you're hearing this, so there could be a couple reasons, and the, the, there might be even more. You're minimizing the cleansing power of Christ's blood, that its cleansing is total and complete. Don't live in unbelief. It's a full cleansing, full atonement. Can it be? Second, you're regarding your own judgment as superior to God's. You're, yours is, high, you know, you're more holy than God, and God can't forgive this. You're putting your sin on a pedestal and focusing on it instead of God's forgiveness. And it's easy to do, to be, just keep staring at the sin and not come stare at the fullness of the Savior and what it does for us. And another one is you're believing the lies of Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren that you're not forgiven rather than accepting and trusting in God's faithful promise to cleanse us and forgive us. Don't listen to the enemy when you have God's word. And then also realize that Christ died not just to set you free from your penalty of your sins, but also from the guilt. So he desires to remove the guilt that we carry for our sin. And so Newton's conclusion and my conclusion, there are some that approach their sin by frequently focusing on it, beating themselves up, and berating themselves to others. You know, and just always, oh, I'm the greatest of sinners, and you're just, you live under it, and it's all you talk about. It's all you think about. And while this may appear to be humble, there's a spiritual way to handle sin, and that is not God's way. Instead, it is, it's many way of trying to deal, it's man's way of trying to deal with guilt through your own resources without taking responsibility to confess and turn away from sin. Confession and repentance are married. It seems the easier avenue, but it's the route to self-focus, pride, and rebellion. This path ignores and in essence rejects Christ's great ability to forgive and to cleanse through confession, as well as the Holy Spirit's power to overcome sin. And so the cycle of sin, guilt, sin, guilt continues to rule and reign in your life, says John Newton. And so what I want you to walk away with this morning is this sinner's who have been saved by the grace of God and the work of Jesus Christ. We have been joined and all of our sins have been separated as far as the east is from the west and they'll never be put to our account again. We're not guilty, we're accepted before this God. And as we continue now in the Christian life and in sin, instead of hiding it and ignoring it, to come and be in agreement with God so that our fellowship by the Spirit can be restored where the power is of abiding in Christ so that we will bear much fruit. So praise be to God, sinners, that there's a way that we can stay in fellowship with a God who is light and in him there is no darkness. I don't think there could be better news for someone like me. I can, I can walk with Christ, a man who hasn't been glorified yet and battles sin every day. You should be hooting and hollering right now.
uh, my, my concluding quote, it's not John Newton, it's, it's Brian Chappell. And Brian Chappell says, repentance, therefore, is fundamentally a humble expression of a desire for a renewed relationship with God. I want back. A relationship that we confess can be secured only by His grace. That's acknowledging again, my only hope is grace. We long for His pardon, His presence, and the Spirit to repair the damage our sin has caused in our relationship with Him. Praise be to God, we have the Holy Spirit to heal this, to to mend it and bring us back into fellowship with Christ. Thus the confession that the allure of the temptation was more real to me than the beauties of your presence, your promises, and your person. And I will turn back, O oh man, to the living God. To God be the glory. Isn't that beautiful? Abide in him and you will bear much fruit. Oh, what a gospel. God, we thank you for it. We thank you the answer is not hiding. It's not staying away from you. It's not trying to do enough good things to offset bad things. Oh, God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that you opened our eyes so that we would come to him and believe in him and have eternal life and be washed and cleansed from all our sin. The penalty laid on Christ. The power broken. The presence still remaining as we wait for that day when it will be removed for all of eternity, we thank you that we can abide in Christ and walk with him and all of our sin and unbelief can be restored. Lord, if we will confess and repent and turn back to Jesus, help sin not to be the main focus, but that we get to have fellowship with you again. That will cause us to hate sin. It will cause us to deal with sin God, let us be abiders in Jesus Christ so that fruit will abound and you will get all the glory, not us, not to our name, but to your name. Give praise, O God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.